I got an email from someone who had recently come to the realization that what had been happening with her horses for their whole life wasn't really good for them. Uh, she thought she was doing what she was supposed to be doing. She simply didn't know any better. So now they're 19 years old and she wants to start over with them. So I love this question and I really feel for the person who's asking about it. So in this episode, I'll share my thoughts about how to start over. So here we go. Episode 45, starting over. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony. Because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. So I want to share parts of the email that I got from this person who really wants to start doing right by her horses. And I think this is a very common story. Well, I, I guess it feels common to me because so many people come to me once they have made this realization that there is a better way and um, they're interested in, in learning it. So here's what she says. She says, I hope you get to read this email from me. I've joined up with you to improve the quality of my horse's lives. They're both 19 year old mares and have been poorly ridden and treated for, I'd say, most of their lives. I realize now how wrong things have been going for them all these years. And what's even sadder is that I knew deep down that what I saw and what I was taught and what I copied was wrong. I knew it. I just didn't know any better. So my question is, how does someone in, this, in my position with older horses retrain them to be like your horses were started. Where do I begin? They have baggage. They have tension. I would go so far to say they don't really trust me. It's not explicit mistrust, but I know there's wariness to say the least. I'm not riding either horse right now. And I was given that advice to not ride because they're so upside down and unfit. And then she just goes on to say she's been doing, you know, the groundwork and really enjoying the Habits for Excellent Horsemanship class. So I'm so glad she's in that course. Uh, my question remains, what does someone like me, who also carries a bunch of guilt over clearly not doing things right for years, how do I turn this around? I want to know where to start and I want to know how to fix this. So again, I can... <laughs> I can really relate. So the first thing I would say to this person is you're, you know, you're not alone. And in reading your email, I was feeling like celebrating. And I hope that you are also celebrating this new awareness. Because no matter when this awareness comes, it's always worth celebrating because there's some people who never, ever get that awareness. So, um, it might not feel like a win, <laughs> but it is because you not only, not only did you, um, come to this realization and do something about it and reach out for even more, you know, more help, but you said that you even knew it back then. And I know that that can be a source of the guilt right? Because you kind of knew you kind of had this feeling, but the trouble is in that moment, often we get feelings, but we don't know what the feelings really mean. Or we even, you know, have an idea, but we are good students and we go to the professional and we try to be the kind of student that follows instructions, right? And then Unfortunately, sometimes we realize that the person that we looked for, looked to for advice, maybe wasn't giving the best advice for us. So I think the the first thing I wanted to say is please do celebrate this awareness because it's not too late. <laughs> and, um, 
I I can totally relate because I myself have a long list of horses that I need to apologize to. And and I it's a horrible feeling and I try, you know, I do my best not to beat myself up up about it, but just look at it as a gift of the knowledge and the realization. And with every horse that I train, I feel like maybe I get closer. <laughs> Maybe I get just a little closer. Maybe I make fewer mistakes. It's hard. Every horse is different. So I think we just have to practice the art of just doing our best. And with any with anybody who's in training, you know, there are many different methods. There are many different styles. There are many different personalities out there. And there are certain things that are quote unquote correct and certain things that are incorrect, certain things that have certain, you know, people and techniques that have good intentions, and some that don't. Some that, you know, don't look at horses as sentient beings with uh, feelings and emotions, and they're just vehicles. So I've, I've done podcasts on this subject before about finding your teacher, and I've written um, blogs. But you want to, no matter... Even even if you're with someone who's really talented and doing the right thing, there still has to be a match between you and what is being taught. And I think this is so, so important. And, you know, even though I think I'm a pretty good teacher, I am fully aware that I am not the right teacher for everybody. And I, I don't think anybody should stay taking lessons with me if it doesn't feel right, because if it doesn't feel right, there's going to be a kind of a deep down, yeah, but <laughs> there's going to be a, a deep down holding, holding back, and you're not going to be getting the most out of the situation. So as in life, we start to realize what does disharmony feel like? What is what are the warning signs so that when we get this feeling of hmm that doesn't feel quite right, we get in the habit of exploring that and sitting down and looking at it and not just dismissing it. And that's just sort of a life a life lesson, something that I've really put a lot of attention into is trying to notice the times in life with horses and with not when I get this really distinct now <laughs> feeling of like, uh, like that something there just didn't resonate. It's out of harmony, it has dissonance somewhere to what's happening and what's in my body. And then I just make a note to myself, mental note. And I'm, I'm, uh, make a point of going and sitting with that and looking at it. So that's kind of moving forward from now. Um, as you seek new advice, you want to get in the habit of not just diving in and go blindly follow anybody, including me, but to approach everything with openness and skepticism and common sense and ask questions. So I love that you're asking this question. So you're on your way. In the way I teach, you'll often hear me highlighting um, the need to trust one's instincts. And so this is connected to this. And to realize that bodies, I believe, bodies naturally seek harmony if given the chance. And I have a belief that we all can feel the difference between harmony and disharmony. We'll know it. And again, it's our brain that gets in the way and says something like, no, no, well, that person's, you know, won a bunch of championships. So what she says must be true, even though it doesn't feel true. So this is out, this is all connected to that same thing. So we really need to get in the habit of trusting our instincts. And when you find that moment of, I'm not sure, again, question, just like you are, question your instructor. Don't be afraid to ask your instructors questions. And again, I've done podcasts on this. <laughs> you can go back and look. But I am so glad that this person is in the Habits for Excellent Horseman Horsemanship course because I think you'll, um, you'll get lots of ideas from there, just how to be with your horses differently. And that really is 
the first piece of advice that popped into my mind for this person was it's, it's going to be less about what you do and it's going to be more about who, who you need to be. And you can go listen to the podcast episode 40, which is about doing versus being. Um, so that's, you need to be a person who is calm, centered, um, mindful in the moment, not beating yourself up, self up and feeling guilty because horses won't understand that it'll create confusion, but it's a good, um, it's a good moment to explore more mindfulness. So perhaps breathing techniques or perhaps meditation, because a lot of time there are these old habits, right? Between you and your horses, um, you'll, you'd, anybody would have, um, an easier time being successful if you started with, um, a horse with equal degrees of baggage, but that you don't know each other, that would actually go faster than when it's a horse with baggage, you know, to use this person's words, um, and you know each other well, because everybody knows the patterns. <laughs> so taking time to get a little bit better about really being in this moment and really seeing what's actually happening in front of you right now is going to be one of the best techniques you can do. The best technique to do is to be, <laughs> be here, be here now. Then when it comes to actually interacting with your horses, the, the thing that I think about the most is that your horses feel seen and heard. So how can we start doing that? So a technique, if you want a technique of something to do, it would be the permission game. So in the Habits for Excellent Horsemanship course, um, if you haven't gotten there yet, there is a video um, on a game that's about asking permission. And this is where it's not teaching the horse anything, but it's, it's just in being around the horse or doing, um, normal sort of things that the horse knows about, like putting a halter on or, um, leading or putting a fly mask on or, you know, grooming any, or even just walking around to the other side of the horse. You, um, have the intention of asking permission of your horse and observing whether or not your horse is giving you permission. So it could be as simple as you're on the right hand side of the horse and you walk around in front to get to the left side and you notice that your horse turns their head in a way that blocks you. So as you're coming to the left side, they turn their head to the left, even just a small amount to really notice that and stop and go, Oh, I'm sorry. And take a step back because the horse is saying, I'm not okay with you there. And then you reapproach. How about now? And if they still block, you step back. Okay, no problem. Take a breath. How about now? And just repeat that with the spirit of politeness, <laughs> with the spirit of you want your horse to feel okay with you. You want your horse to trust you. And so, of course, if they're saying, I'm not okay with this, then it's not a behavior problem. It's not a disobedience. They're expressing themselves. And this is what you want. You want your horse to feel seen and heard. So you keep repeating this. And what I found is in, in just repeating that, oh, I'm sorry. How about now? Maybe three, four times is typical. And you'll, you'll see the horse give you the permission. And to me, it's like night and day, night and day. I mean, just think about in your own human life, the difference between, you know, someone just coming up and putting their hands on you. If you think you don't trust them and someone asking, you know, may I, may I do this, <laughs> you know, so think of, you know, your horse giving you consent and the whole intention during this time is 
Well, you can make your own intention, but with horses like this, that where my my intention is to restart them and really change their view of how things are going to go, I will set an intention such as you are safe or I love you or whatever makes sense to you. And then I use a simple phrase like that as almost like a mantra. And so when I'm around my horse, I, I sometimes will say it out loud. I think that's helpful. It's breathing. You get to hear the sound of your own voice. But if nothing else, you're saying it on the inside. And just like a mantra, if you repeat it over and over again, almost like a little loop in your brain, then other thoughts don't get a chance to come in. So when you're with your horse, you might just keep repeating something like, oh, I love you. You're safe. I love you. You can trust me. I love you. I want you to feel safe. And I know that might sound a little silly or weird or woo woo, but I don't really care because <laughs> it works. And when you keep that in the front of your mind, it's going to be um, changing your behavior because you you can't help but embody that. It's like, it's hard to be sad when you're playing the banjo, right? If you have a, a mantra in your head of you're safe, I love you, you will act. You will have a behavior of, of making sure you keep your horse safe and that they feel loved. It's really hard to like smack your horse and tell them that you love them at the same time. Your body won't want to do that. Not that you would want to smack them anyway. So... Anytime that your horse says, I'm not okay, acknowledge it, honor it. And then when they do um, give you the permission, then thank them. I mean, literally thank them. I say thank you a lot to my horses. I say, try, I do my best to say thank you more than I say good boy or good girl. So sometimes it's helpful to think of your horse, not as a horse, but more of a, um, more of like a, a, a wild animal. You know, how would you, how would you coax a squirrel out of the woods to eat out of your hand? Right? You wouldn't like lasso it. <laughs> okay. You could lasso it and drag the squirrel in and hold it, but I don't think that's what we're looking for. You know, you would be still, you would offer something that it likes you might, you would maybe divert your eyes. You would surround yourself with things that it likes. You know, think of, think of how that would feel to coax a squirrel out of the woods and how magical it would feel to have that squirrel end up sitting in your lap. And okay, some of you might not want squirrels. So pick an animal that you like. <laughs> pick something cute and furry that you would love to have come up. What would it feel like if a deer just walked out of the woods and came and sat in your lap? So maybe we need to start thinking of our horses a little bit like that and be just as amazed and just as honored when they allow us in. So there are some more tangible things that I can point you to. So in the video classroom, there's a video, um, February, 2011, and it's called building rapport with Duncan. And this is a FEI dressage horse that, um, came to me for some help for several reasons. And in this video, the February, 2011 video, it's one of my first sessions interacting on the ground. I think I did one session and then I thought I have to video this. <laughs> so, uh, we have the video of the next session and I kind of talk through what my intention is. And I think you're going to really like, you know, what I'm talking about there, because I can demonstrate it. And I really, you know, share some of the things I've already talked about here, but you get to actually see me doing it with a horse right there. So I would definitely advise checking out in the video classroom, February, 2011, building rapport with Duncan. And if you go to this podcast on my website, dressagenaturally.net, slash podcast and look up this episode, episode 45, uh, in the show notes on that page, I'll put, um, I'll write these down and you can find them again easily. 
So also for horses like this, um, you want to give them a lot of freedom and choice. And so the permission game already is a way to give horses freedom and choice, right? We're saying, I would like to put your halter on and you have a choice of telling me it's okay or not okay. So that's some um, a, an example of freedom and choice already. But um, freedom and choice is also something that I really, really focus on um, with horses like this. And it's a really good reset. And again, I'm very aware, like if they're in the grooming stall, instead of cross tying them, I might just swing the rope over their back. And if they feel like they want to leave, instead of saying, no, stay here, I might go, okay, and I'll follow them out and I'll see where they want to go. Sometimes you'll realize that they're, um, they're nervous in the, in the grooming stall and you never really knew it. Sometimes they just were like, no, nah, it's enough of this. I'm going to go eat some grass. And either way, I think it's okay to join them in this. And this is where some people are going to be like, ah, you're spoiling your horse. You're letting them, you know, get away with things. Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, you could do it in a way of that, but here's the thing. There's a big difference between, let's say you're in the grooming stall, your horse, you've just thrown the lead rope over the horse's back. They're not cross-tied and your horse says, I kind of feel like I want to get out of here. And you say, no, you need to stay in here. And then your horse barges out anyway. Okay. So that would be in that moment, you're actively saying, stay here. And your horse is like, nope, leaving. <laughs> so now you're just making your communication meaningless. So that's different than you're in there in the grooming stall. You threw the lead rope over the horse's back. And you feel your horse going, I kind of want to leave. And you go, great idea. Let's go. And now you both go out there. So it's just a, a change of the decision of what you're doing in the moment. And yeah, your horse decided. But if you practice it that way, then it doesn't ruin the moment where, let's say down the road, when you've re rehabilitated your horse and he is okay in the cross, in the grooming stall, but he's kind of just like, eh, I think I'm going to just walk over there. And you go, hang on, not now, stay here. And then he'll be like, oh, okay. You know, you can, if you, if you treat it not like a disobedience, as you treat it of I'm changing my mind and I'm going to go do the horse's idea. Now you're still in harmony and you haven't ruined any communication. You haven't said, you haven't taught the horse that they can ignore you because you never told them that they couldn't leave. I hope this makes sense. Huge night and day difference. So if you, if you practice just changing your mind and joining your horse, then like I said, it, it won't ruin it because another day you could say, mm, no, I'm not joining you in that. I really like you to stay and they'll feel the difference. They're like, oh, okay. This time I'm not allowed to leave. And they realize it's communication, not just training them that they're never allowed to move out of the wash doll. Uh, when I start giving my horses freedom and choice, you would be, I'll be curious, whoever tries this, how many horses, when you don't cross tie them in the grooming stall and you just put the lead rope over their, over their backs, how many horses end up turning around and going and sniffing what's behind them. So many horses do this. When you give them the choice, they end up turning around and going and checking out what's always been behind them that they've never been able to go check out. It's amazing. And, you know, and so then the horses that are worried, they get a chance to just go look at it. The horses that are just curious, finally get to satisfy that curiosity. And like, who cares? So we can be sideways in the grooming stall while I brush you. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. But it, it doesn't matter to me. It's a small compromise, but it can mean so much to the horse. They get to know their environment. They get to, to have this decision making with you and this conversation with you. Because remember, conversation is an exchange of information. It's not dictation. It's not a lecture. 
I don't want to be lecturing my horses. I don't want to be bossing my horses. I want a conversation with my horse. And that means that they get to decide. And even now, you know, as recently as last week, I went to put the bridle on Solana and she looked away. And that's not normal for her. And so I played with it a little bit. And then I went, you know what? I told my my assistant was tacking her up. I said, no, that's okay. I'll play with her online. And I just changed my mind because, you know, I want to listen to her. For some reason, she didn't want to be ridden. And that's not normal. And the next day she was ready to be ridden. She was on it. She was great. So we're not letting them get away with something. It's a totally different way of being with your horse. Um, other things that you can do with horses like this uh, is positive reinforcement. So, you know, all I'm not a positive reinforcement only person. I'm not a never positive reinforcement. I incorporate positive and negative reinforcement um, in my training. And, but for horses like this who need to feel um, really successful and feel really well paid and appreciated, positive reinforcement is great for that. And you can add positive reinforcement on to the end of anything that you do. You can ask your horse to yield to pressure. And if they do a really great job, you can say, good, and give them a cookie. Uh, so you can add positive, positive reinforcement to anything. But when... Um, when I think about positive reinforcement, also, I often think about um, what I call my silly horse tricks. So really silly things like put your foot in the bucket, touch the thing with your nose, go pick up the thing, you know, whatever it is, silly horse tricks. Um, but the thing that's really powerful about silly horse tricks, and I've, I've done podcasts and blogs on this before, and you can find videos of this in the classroom if you click on the video label called Tricks. Um, but, but the benefit of the silly horse tricks is they are so distinct um, and specific and everybody's going to know when you're successful, including your horse, which is the most important. So, you know, you have a, a mat or a board or a bucket and you ask your horse to put their foot on the mat or in the bucket, you know, the rubber feed tub. And when they do it, they know they did it <laughs> much different than dressage where like, is there enough bend in the shoulder? And I don't know. So it's a really great way to build that communication with your horse in a very clear and easy way. And, um, the horses get really happy about it because they get paid really well <laughs> with their favorite cookies or scratches. Now, the other thing, um, that, that this woman asked or mentioned was that she wasn't riding them. And so if you want to think about things to do online, my absolute most highly recommended thing to do um, would be moving massage. So again, in the video classroom, you can uh, look on the video labels over on the right hand column, uh, click on moving massage. There's several videos in there with all different kinds of horses. And moving massage is just such a beautiful exercise. It's just what it sounds like. You're um, touching your horse with the intention of relieving any tension in their body, with getting more relaxed and relaxed on a deeper level um, by just simply bringing awareness to them. You're not like doing, you know, effleurage or, you know, petrissage. You're not doing trigger point therapy, but you're just feeling your horse and sending that love through your hand. And if you ever feel an area where your horse feels any sign of even a little bit of discomfort or tension, you just stay there and you breathe with them through it until that tension melts. And the cool thing about this is that you do it while moving and that just gives so much more biofeedback. So they relax a little bit, they move more freely, you get more information. And it's, this is a really powerful exercise um, that can really transform the relationship uh, you have with your horse, especially your relationship through touch. So highly, highly recommend that. And then as things start to progress and you start to want to really um, think about their biomechanics even more and have more, more conversations and challenge them to move their bodies a little bit differently than all the sweet spot 
um, in the video classroom, you can look at the sweet spot uh, video label and look at the, the exercises online to get that nice stretched forward, energized, relaxed, balanced posture. Um, and so when you get to that point, you can always check with us again and we'll point you to videos. Um, you know, anybody can email us and go, what video were you talking about? But once you get into the video classroom, it's really easy to find most videos. So those are some, you know, some resources you can use. I think some, um, ways of looking at it. I think one of the hardest things to do is to not try too hard to do a different technique. Again, it's what I said in the beginning, it's more about being differently and be gentle with yourself in this process and just know it's never, it's never too late to start over. I've had students come with horses that age and, you know, every day is a new day and, and, you know, dogs are all about unconditional love. Well, horses are all about forgiveness. So this is going to be a really healing process for all of you <laughs> and for anybody else who's listening, who's in the same experience. Tomorrow is always a new day. So it's never too late to start over and just simply keep doing your best and know that with you yourself and all of us, myself included, our best changes day to day and it gets better over time. We hope <laughs> we think about it um, and use the, use the lessons instead of feeling guilty, use them to learn and just do learn the lesson. And that's, that's the promise I make to myself. I feel bad about it. I write my horse's name down and I apologize to him. And then I have to let it go because I know that in recognizing it and naming it, I've made my commitment to do better next time. And that's all we can do. So I hope this helps many people out there who have this similar kind of experience or experience the same situation right now. And as always, um, let me know. Go to Dressage Naturally Land Facebook group and I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you. Thank you.